Two days after the McNamara trial, before I could leave Los Angeles and return to my home and friends in Chicago, I was myself arrested and indicted on two counts of trying to suborn, to bribe, to fix the McNamara jury. One of my associates hired Bert Franklin, a detective and former investigator for the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, to investigate prospective jurors in the McNamara trial. He did more than investigate them. He offered five of them bribes to bring in a verdict of not guilty or, if that wasn't possible, to hang the jury. There's no doubt about what Franklin did. He was caught by five Burns detectives as he stood on the corner of 3rd and Los Angeles streets in broad daylight, giving Lockwood a $500 down payment. I was standing across the street at the time, saw him do it. For weeks, Franklin wouldn't say who he was acting for, if anyone. He did say that I hadn't anything to do with it or any knowledge that it was being done. Then Franklin was put on trial. He pleaded guilty and was led off with a fine. After that, he told the grand jury that I had given him the money, told him who to bribe and how and with how much. And so I was indicted. When Judge Hutton called the case of the people against Clarence Darrow, my lawyer, Earl Rogers, stood up as I had so many times and said, ready, Your Honor. Then I guess he had to touch me on the shoulder and say, Clarence, you're supposed to stand to, you're the defendant. Of course, I took an active part on my own behalf, especially in the cross-examination of Franklin. Mr. Franklin, if I were sending you out to bribe a prospective juror, would I give you a check that could be traced back, or would I give you cash? If I wanted to bribe prospective jurors, would I send you, my chief investigator, whose every move was being watched by Burns operatives, or would I import a stranger for the dirty work? If I knew you were passing a bribe, would I let myself be seen in the vicinity? Would I pick one of the busiest corners in all Los Angeles? Would I have crossed the street to talk to you when I saw Detective Brown walking right behind you? Or are all these things details in a gigantic plot to destroy as many of labor's leaders and defenders as possible. Gentlemen of the jury, I think I can say that no one in my native town would have made to any jury any such statement as was made of me by the district attorney in opening this trial, I'll venture to say he could not afterward have found a companion in Chicago except among crooks and detectives if he had dared open his mouth that way. And yet here I am in his hands, think of it, in a position where he can call me a coward. And in all my life, I never saw or heard so cowardly, sneaky, and brutal an act as District Attorney Ford committed in this courtroom before this jury. In examining you before you were accepted as jurors, the District Attorney asked you whether, if I should address you, you would be likely to be carried away by sympathy. You won't be if you wait for me to ask for sympathy. I have never asked sympathy of anybody, and I am not going to ask it of you 12. I would rather go to the penitentiary than ask for sympathy. All I'm asking is that you consider Franklin's story. Is it reasonable or is it absurd? Leave out the moral question. Leave out the tradition of a profession that I had followed for 35 years, would I take that chance? Would these gumshoe men everywhere, their eyes on everyone connected with the case,
Detectives over the town, thick as lice in Egypt. Gentlemen, don't ever think your own life or liberty is safe, that your own family is secure. Don't think any human being is safe. When, under evidence like this, I, with some influence and some respect, am brought here and placed in the shadow of the penitentiary. I know my life. I know what I have done. My life has not been perfect. It's been human, too human. I have tried to help in the world. I have not had malice in my heart. I have done the best I could. I ask you to save my liberty and my name. The jury was out only 34 minutes before they came in. I thought they wanted instructions from the judge. But the foreman, Williams, stood up, said he had a verdict, and smiled and called out, not guilty. Ruby was at my side. We hugged and kissed. First person to get to us was Judge Hutton, who ran down from the bench and embraced me. <laughs> I said I felt a stranger in Los Angeles. Well, that wasn't so true by the end of the trial. Many people were very kind to me. One was Senator William Bora of Idaho, who had prosecuted the Haywood case, which I defended. In the middle of my trial, someone said to him that since I'd obviously bribed the McNamara jury, I'd probably done the same with Haywood, and that's how we'd won. Barra said, no, Darrow didn't bribe those jurors. He just frightened them to death. <laughs> I was gladder than you know to get home to Chicago, even if for a long time Chicago didn't seem so glad to have me. That's the way things are sometimes. The charge hangs on after the acquittal. It took some people many years to forget what they thought I'd done, trust me with their cases. Some never forgot. Of all the clients I'd represented before my own trial, corporate, labor, individual, none ever asked me to represent him again. It was three months before I got my first case, a year before I started making a living. I had a mostly criminal practice now, and I met and defended some unpopular people, unfortunate souls, murderers, alleged or in fact. I never hesitated to defend a man accused of murder, if only to prevent a second murder by the state. These were hard times for unpopular people. Red baiting, Palmer raids, witch hunts, government and newspapers telling people to mob, jail, and kill dissenters. Like the 16 Chicago communists guilty of the crime of talk. Or the secretary of the Rockford branch of the Communist Labor Party accused of using the entire resources of his party's treasury, the entire 30 cents to overthrow the government of the United States. <laughs> the 11 Italian anarchists in Milwaukee, who may have had the bad taste to call this country a jail and our president a pig, but gentlemen of the jury, those are errors of judgment rather than transgressions against the legal structure. I shall not argue to you whether the defendant's ideas are right or wrong, I am not bound to believe them right in order to take their case. You're not bound to believe them right in order to find them not guilty. But if this jury makes it harder for any man to be a rebel, you will be doing the most you could for the damnation of the human race. We lost most of these political cases in court, lost them again on appeal. But every now and then, one judge would agree with us in dissent. If there's only one man to state the case for freedom, maybe that's all it takes, one. In addition to the law, I did some 
lecturing and debating on the Chautauqua circuit when we got back to Chicago. It helped with the expenses those first few years, and eventually I grew to enjoy it as much as anything I did. I always took the anti-side in debate. I liked the feeling of getting to my feet after my opponent had gotten his ovation and facing an audience of 500 or 1,000 people waiting for me to fall on my face. And I like trying to turn some of those people toward my way of thinking, at least get them to ask themselves a question or two. Should the United States have prohibition? You take out of the world all the men who have drunk down through the past. You take away all the poetry, literature, practically all the works of genius the world has produced. <laughs> what kind of a poem do you suppose you'd get out of a glass of ice water? <laughs> Does man have an immortal soul? Once I was debating a man who got carried away and told the audience, I'm the master of my fate, I'm the captain of my soul. Captain of his soul, hell, he wasn't even deckhand on a raft. <laughs> Is life worth living? No. <laughs> I see a fine-looking lady in the seventh row is a good argument for the other side. <laughs> One of the things I believed in all these years that was even less popular than the labor movement was free love. It was commonly said I spoke for it in the abstract, also that I believed in it in the particular unsuitable occasions. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that after Ruby and I were married, she kept a close eye on me. Anyway, rumors about philandering don't do you nearly as much harm as the people who spread them would like to believe. The only time I was seriously concerned about a thing like that is when I was told that a district attorney had a picture, which could have been tricked up, of me leaving the home of a beautiful widow at dawn, and he planned to use it against me in court. But a friend told me not to let it bother me. My enemies have believed the worst of me even without the photograph. My friends would know it was a fake. They'd know that if I'd spent the night at the home of a beautiful woman, I wouldn't have left at dawn. I'd have stayed for breakfast. <laughs> I've often told young men starting out in business not to make acquaintances, but to make friends. Acquaintances are of little value unless you want to run for office. And I'm sure that each of you has a higher ambition than that. <laughs> When I was a little boy growing up on a farm outside Kinsman, I was taught to believe as an article of faith that any little boy growing up anywhere in America could eventually, someday, hope to become the president of this great land and all its people. Now I'm beginning to believe it. Being a lawyer, on the other hand, now that's a different kettle of fish. It's a high art requiring sophisticated discipline, the most rigid application of scientific principles. How to pick a jury, for example. If a Presbyterian enters a jury box and carefully rolls up his umbrella, let him go. He's cold as a grave. He knows right from wrong, though he seldom finds anything right. Get rid of him with the fewest possible words before he contaminates the others. If possible, Baptists are even more hopeless than Presbyterians, and the sooner they leave, the better. <laughs> Methodists are worth considering. They're near the soil. If chance sets you down between a Methodist and a Baptist, you'll move toward the Methodist to keep warm. <laughs> Either a Lutheran or a Scandinavian is unsafe, but if both in one, plead your client guilty and go down the docket. <laughs> I've never been much for organized religion or anything else that tells people what they ought to believe and what'll happen to them if they don't. The fear of God or anything else isn't the beginning of wisdom. Better to have doubt. Doubt leads to investigation. That's the beginning of wisdom. Still, I'm a lawyer, and I'm supposed to check these things out for myself. Ruby and I took a vacation in Palestine to see where it all began. We met an Arab boatman who offered to row us out to the spot where Jesus walked on the water. All he wanted for this was 
No wonder Jesus walked. <laughs> The most religious people, the most righteous believers of all are, of course, the fundamentalists, who believe that every word in the Bible is literally true and don't want the schools or anyone else teaching anything different. Noah got two of every species of animal on the ark, including a million insects. <laughs> Joshua made the sun stand still so the day could be lengthened so he could finish the battle. Balaam's ass spoke to him, probably in Hebrew. <laughs> Many asses have spoken, doubtless some in Hebrew. <laughs> but they have not been that breed of ass. <laughs> William Jennings Bryan, welcome to Tennessee, sir. You've made a considerable study of the Bible, haven't you, Mr. Bryan? You've written and published articles in the Bible almost weekly for 50 years. You believe that everything in the Bible should be interpreted literally? So that when you read the whale swallowed Jonah, you accept that literally? Was that the ordinary run of whale or made especially for that purpose? <laughs> I see, it was a miracle. You believe Joshua made the sun stand still? Then you also believe at that time the sun went around the earth. No? Then it must have been the earth he made stand still. Have you ever pondered what would naturally happen to the earth if it stood suddenly still? Don't you know it would have been converted into a molten mass of matter? Don't you care? <laughs> You believe the story of the flood? When was the flood? 2,348 B.C. That's according to Bishop Usher's calculations, and you accept them, all right? You believe that all living things not contained in the ark were destroyed, so that 4,273 years ago, that's taking the 1,925 years since the Bible, adding them to the 2,348 years going back to the flood. So that 4,273 years ago, there was not a living thing on earth excepting the people on the ark, the animals on the ark, and the fishes. Any idea who Noah threw the rope to when he docked the ark? <laughs> When the Bible says the morning and the evening were the first day, does that mean anything to you? Were those 24-hour days? No? Any idea how long they were? You believe the sun was made on the fourth day? Then how could you distinguish the evening from the morning of the first three days without any sun? The Bible does, your Bible does. Doesn't that bother you? You say my argument's going in one ear and out the other. I'm not surprised there's nothing in between to stop it. <laughs> if today you can take a thing like evolution and make it a crime to teach it in schools, tomorrow you can make it a crime to teach it in church, and the next session you may ban books and newspapers. If you can do the one, you can do the other. A lot of people thought that as I got older and closer to my final exams, I'd get religion, even after the monkey trial. I never did. I still believe that when I die, nothing will be left over, neither heaven or hell. Ruby has a slightly different point of view. She believes there's a heaven and a hell, but it won't make any difference which I go to. I'll have so many good friends in both places. <laughs> I don't look forward to death because I don't like to give up those I love, especially now that I have grandchildren. And I've lived so long I've formed the habit. But neither do I fear death, which at least brings rest and peace. i found that no one wants another life. We all just want to go on living, which is quite a different matter. 
Maybe someday we'll even be willing to let the other fellow live. A committee came to me from the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People asking me to defend 11 Negroes in Detroit who were charged with murder. I told them I was tired after 48 years in the law and not mentally or physically fit. I knew I would go even when I was making the excuse. I knew as soon as they told me about Dr. Ossian Sweet. In the early days, Detroit and other northern cities were friendly to Negroes, but that was a long time ago. Now, you all know about the Chicago riots, which began when a colored boy in a raft was washed onto a white bathing beach, where men and boys of my race stoned him to death. 120 people killed in those riots. Washington, St. Louis, Detroit, I'm not blaming Detroit, I'm saying what happened here. Dr. Sweet bought a house, a nice house, on the corner of Charlevoix and Garland streets in an all-white section. As soon as the neighborhood heard he was a Negro, they banded together into a neighborhood improvement association and made threats. Dr. Sweet asked the police for protection, which they provided, and moved his wife and goods into the house. He took his two brothers and some friends with him. He also took a number of rifles and a valise full of cartridges. First night a crowd gathered, made some noise, but that was all. Inside the house, nobody went to bed. They kept the lights off, looked out the windows all night. Second night, the crowd grew bigger, more boisterous. Eight or 10 policemen were stationed around the place, but it seemed they were mainly ornamental. Then, as the men in the house were standing at the windows with guns, Dr. Sweet's brother drove up. The mob attacked him as he tried to make his way to the house and then rushed the house, throwing rocks as they came. Shots were fired from the house into the street where a white man, Leo Briner, was killed. All 11 people in the house were arrested on the spot and charged with murder in the first degree. I came to the Detroit jail to meet Dr. Sweet. He was a young man, serious, quiet, attractive. He told me about that night, about the mob yelling, niggers, get them, get the niggers, and the people rushing the house like a human sea, is how he described it, and the stones hailing against the house. When I opened the door to let my brother in and saw the mob, he said, I knew I was facing the same mob that had hounded my people through its entire history. In my mind, I was confident of what I was up against. I knew what mobs had done to my people before. The legal problem was to show that the people outside the house had constituted a mob which endangered the Sweet's lives. The prosecution said they did not. There were far too few of them to represent any danger. They presented so many eyewitnesses to testify there had not been a mob. The witnesses themselves were a mob. <laughs> but the real problem was to show that this was not a murder case, but one of race prejudice. My friend, the prosecutor, says, gentlemen, that this isn't a race question. Race and color have nothing to do with this case. This is a case of murder. I insist there's nothing but prejudice in this case, that if it was reversed and 11 white men had shot and killed a black while protecting their home and lives against a mob of blacks, no one would have dreamed of having them indicted. I know what I'm talking about, and so do you. They would have been given medals instead. You 12 white men are trying a colored man on race prejudice. You needn't tell me you're not prejudiced. I know better. We're not very much but a bundle of prejudices anyway. We're prejudiced against other people's color, prejudiced against other men's religions, prejudiced against other people's politics, prejudiced against people's looks, prejudiced about the way they dress, 
were full of prejudices. My only hope, gentlemen of the jury, is this, that you are strong enough and honest enough and decent enough to lay prejudice aside in this case and decide it as you ought to. I have watched day after day these black, tense faces that now are looking to you 12 whites, feeling that the hopes and fears of a race are in your keeping. Their eyes are fixed on you. Their hearts go out to you. Their hopes hang on your verdict. The jury deliberated over 40 hours, finally reported they couldn't agree, and the judge had to declare a mistrial. We tried the case a second time. This time, we won. Every few days, I get a letter from some friend asking why they never see me anymore, whether they have in some way offended me. I reply, no, nothing like that has happened. I'm always glad to see my friends. I'm only letting go of things in general. Of course, I shall see you soon, I say, and we'll have you over to our house. And I mean it, too, but the next day, the armchair lures me back to its depths. By and by, I gaze out the window down over the treetops of the park. The walk winds through the green, velvety grass on toward the lake, so blue and beautiful. I don't really feel like going anywhere today. Perhaps tomorrow I'll go to see my friends. Perhaps. I'd feel better about my work if I could see some advance had been made in the law. Since I was admitted to the bar more than 50 years ago, in science and mathematics, the world has been made over new. Even in religion, there's an entirely modified and broader attitude. The whole material world has been made over. But the law and its administration have stood frozen and adamant, defying time and eternity and all the changes of our day and age. You wonder what the compensations are? For me, there has been one that's made it all worthwhile. A hundred and two men I have defended have faced the death penalty and none has been hanged, and none ever will be, because I would never dare take another chance. <laughs> unless, unless I knew there was no other way. Why did they kill? Not for money, not for spite, not for hate. They kill little Bobby Franks as they might kill a spider or a fly for the experience. They killed him because they were made that way. Because somewhere in the infinite processes that go to the making up of the boy or the man, something slipped. And these unfortunate lads sit here, hated, despised outcasts, with the community shouting for their blood. Your Honor, when the public is concerned and demands a punishment, no matter what the offense, great or small, it thinks of only one punishment, and that is death. None of us is unmindful of the public, Your Honor. I have stood here for three months as one might stand at the ocean trying to sweep back the tide. I hope the seas are subsiding and the wind is falling, and I believe they are, but I wish to make no false pretense to this court. 
the easy thing to do and the popular thing to do will be to hang Dickie Loeb and Babe Leopold, men and women who do not think will applaud, the cruel and thoughtless will approve, but more and more fathers and mothers who are gaining an understanding and asking questions not only about these poor boys, but about their own. They will join a no acclaim at the death of my clients. They would ask that the shedding of blood be stopped. Your honor stands between the future and the past. I know the future is with me and what I stand for here. I am pleading for a time when hatred and cruelty will not control the hearts of men. And we can learn by reason and judgment and understanding that all life is worth saving and that mercy is the highest attribute of man. I feel I should apologize for the length of time I have taken. This case may not be as important as I think it is. If I should succeed in saving these boys' lives and do nothing for the progress of the law, I should be sad indeed. If I can succeed, my greatest reward and my greatest hope will be that I have done something to help human understanding, to temper justice with mercy, to overcome hate with love. I was reading last night of the aspiration of the old Persian poet, Omar Khayyam. It appealed to me as the highest that I can vision. I wish it was in my heart, and I wish it was in the hearts of all. So I be written in the book of love. I do not care about that book above. Erase my name, or write it as you will. So I be written in the book of love. IBM is pleased to have brought you this special television adaptation of the stage hit, Clarence Barry. We hope you enjoy it. Most of our lives are spent trying to exchange our thoughts and feelings with the people around us. The art of communicating is an essential part of being human. We managed to change our thoughts into primitive speech and symbols which others could understand. The symbols evolved into writing. And writing could be sent by runners and ships between widely separated cultures. We had started the exchange of ideas and information slowly. The exchange moved rapidly when the printing press allowed us to duplicate what we wrote. We learned to make images of what we saw. We kept on refining our ability to communicate. We learned to do it faster. We learned to speak to one another over great distances. We could preserve our ideas with sound recordings and with motion pictures. 
information communicated by means of our new tools became an intimate part of our lives. The tools we use to keep in touch with one another have become widespread. We continue to extend and simplify the exchange of ideas and information. The most versatile of our new tools, the computer, has become an important communications device to handle vast amounts of information for people all over the world. Computers help us keep in touch with complex, changing information and events. The computer can store information, organize it at our request, and return the information instantly in a form we can use. Hospitals can use the computer for immediate access to diagnostic test data about their patients. Blood type A, RH negative. Students can be kept up to date about career requirements and opportunities. Computers give police officers rapid access to information about stolen property. Computers help engineers and designers visualize their ideas more effectively. The computer can translate signals from a satellite into photographs that give information about land resources. The computer has become one of the important tools in the exchange of ideas and information. It extends what has always been one of our basic accomplishments, the ability to communicate.